Well, good morning and welcome again to Rise and Shine, our daily Bible study to inspire, inform, and impact your life in ways you never imagined possible. Well, now we're jumping into the Gospel of John, the fourth and final Gospel, um, often represented by the symbol of, of an eagle because of its um, higher level, you know, kind of panoramic view of what it means to live in the Christian life, what it means to be a disciple. So these are thoughtful people that after the death of John the Apostle, took all of his stories, uh, his teachings, his memories, and they put it down into a, a pattern for future generations, right? For us to remember what he said, uh, what he learned, what he uh, was taught by Jesus about his ministry and, and presented in such a way that we would continue to dig and learn and grow what it means to be a disciple. Um, and so we're learning about the, the difference that it makes. Not in Luke's gospel, Luke, remember, uh, wants to provide an orderly account. Um, these are the things that happened sequentially building up to the culmination. Same thing with Mark and with Matthew, although their audiences are, are radically different and therefore they have different purposes. So as we jump into the beginning of the Gospel of John, you're going to see right away um, how challenging it is. And so what I want you to do as we kind of get into it, we're, um, believe it or not, in, when we did the other Gospels, we were doing a chapter a day. Um, we're going to have to slow that way down, uh, maybe half a chapter a day. So it's going to take us a while. Um, but to be honest, we're in no hurry. We'll get through it. Um, and as we do so, we're going to digest a lot more. We're going to mine it for all that we can because John here is giving us signs and symbols to help us understand at a far deeper level uh, what Jesus is trying to do, what his presence here on earth and the impact that it's having on our lives as well. So as we jump into it, I want you to look at it again as John's gospel as being a play that is about to open, right? There's, there's the characters that come on stage and off stage. There's dialogue, which is important. But also pay attention to, to what's happening. What, what is the scene that is being set? Where is it happening? What's the location? The, day, the time of day that is happening? Um, and, and listen to not just what is said, but how it is said. Um, you're going to see some language changes that are going to be very important for us to understand what uh, John is trying to teach us. Okay? Well, as a church, our mission is to be the body of Christ. And so, obviously, we should know the Gospels. We should know what each of them is doing and how they are doing it. Um, and so we join together to be the body of Christ, the church. We pray for our witness that we can reclaim our heritage. We can reclaim our message and our mission. Remember, in the military, whenever uh, soldiers are supp supposed to go here or there, they are given orders. And so can you ever imagine a soldier saying, hey, I just, I just did not pay any attention to the orders. I, I didn't look at them. I don't remember them. I lost them. I'm just going to do my own thing. And the challenge is, is how many of us as church folk, how many churches have just forgotten their orders, what it is, why they exist. You signed up for this. You are a church. You are the body of Christ. How can you forget what your mission is? And yet we often do. God is patient, but not always. There will come a time when that judgment, uh, what you signed up for, will come home to roost. Okay, so we pray for our church. Let us pray for our, our faith and our witness um, that we would remember who we are. Father, I pray that you'll bring new life and blessings to Mount Pleasant far beyond anything that we could ask or imagine. Amen. We are also, right, soldiers. We're not just an audience. You don't just show up on Sunday morning and get good entertainment. You get your marching orders. This is what it means to be a disciple. Um, it, it is a calling. You are called to be an ambassador. Uh, we're given the ministry, Paul says, the ministry of reconciliation. We become living saints that go out to be salt and light into this world, to draw people to Christ. And so that's what we're called to do. Let us now pray that we would have the courage to do exactly that. 
God, grant me a courageous heart willing to explore the unknown, trusting your voice to guide me. Save me from the emptiness of easy answers and safe shelters. Let me be bold and brave, willing to sacrifice temporary comforts and simple answers to find wonders beyond my wildest dreams. My heart tells me I was made for more, that all these things are possible with your help. So grant me the courage to take the next bold step. Amen. Uh, I've got my notes, got the Bible. Um, let's jump in. We're actually only going to be making it through uh, to the first 18 verses. Okay, so we're going to we're going to kind of have to stop uh, halfway through. Um, let us begin. Okay, so uh, as we begin, think about the initial scene of any play. The curtains are pulled back. What is it that we are entering into? What is our story? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now there was a man who was sent from God, and his name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and, through, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and dwelt and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is, close, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, right? So that is a powerful prelude. This is a prelude. This is an introduction to what we're about to engage in. There were several questions that John had to deal with in in the early days in Ephesus, and not only Ephesus, but in uh, all of Asia Minor, as the church began to uh, expand beyond Asia Minor all the way to Rome, these are the kind of issues about uh, the nature of Jesus, right? Was Jesus God? What does that mean? Um, was he somebody like in Eastern mysticism? Eastern mysticism kind of holds that uh, if you undergo significant amount of meditation, um, if you prepare your heart, if you uh, have a certain amount of enlightenment, then you can be elevated upon your death to a level of deity. You can become part of the universe, the consciousness. Um, you can have divine consciousness. John is kind of breaking through all of that from the very beginning. There's a couple of things that he wants us to know right from the get-go. First of all, he wants you to know that in the beginning was the Word. Now, we talked about this a little bit, I think, last time. Word that is used here in our English language is in the Greek logos, or logic, where we get the term logic. It is a, a, a sense of there was a truth or a logic, an orderness to the universe. There is a mind that makes everything run, right? We, we talk about the natural order of things. We talk about um, ecosystems that are ordered and are, are um, harmonious in the way they work together. John is saying that in the beginning, there was this mind. And, and this is a Greek concept, right? 
John is, is reaching out to or communicating to Hellenistic Christians, Christians that have some sense of who Jesus is. They, they've heard the stories, but they're immersed in a Hellenistic culture. How does this jive as it's expanding across the empire? And so he says, in the beginning was this logos, and that would have resonated with the Greeks. Um, it, it is truth. There is a truth. There is a divine truth. There, a truth that differentiates itself from evil, from falsehood. There is a sense of what you should or what you ought to be doing that everyone uh, recognizes. He also hearkens back, for those of us that have a scriptural um, foundation, He's also hearkening back to the Genesis account. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. The first thing that God creates is a sense of light in the midst of the darkness. The light is from God. The darkness is not the, not the evil or a substance. It is the absence of light. So God creates and it fills the vacuum that is created by darkness. But he goes beyond that, doesn't he? In the beginning was this Logos, but this Logos was with God. It was with God, and yet it was God. How can it be with and at the same time be? He was with God in the beginning, this word, this Logos. This Logos is given a personal identity. It is with God, the Creator. By definition, God is the Creator. And yet through him, all things were made. He is the catalyst through which reality came into being. Without the word, reality would not exist. Or to put it, perhaps put it another way, reality is the logos that has emerged from God. God spoke it, and at that point of contact, this You'll see this later in John's Gospel. The point of contact between God's Word and the reality, the action, is the Logos. The Logos is the thing or the person that makes that a reality, the will of God come into being. Though he was in the world, uh, he was life, and that life is the light of all mankind. Okay, we talked about this uh, prior in... Um, all the way back in 1 John. See if I can find it here quickly. Ah. Okay. Um, so listen to 1 John. John talking about it in 1 John chapter... 1 verse 5. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness of, at all. If we claim to have fellowship in him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not have the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. Notice the focus on this duality. And, and we talked about this last time. You're going to see a lot of dualistic language. That does not mean, and I, I probably ought to make this clear, we're not dualists. Dualists, people that believe that, believe that there are two equal powers at war in, in the universe. There's the power of good against the power of evil, and they're at war. Pantheists tend to be dualists as well. And what they mean is, is that they're at, at battle, they're at war. That's not what this is. John will talk about the dualistic language to show that Jesus brings to clarity the differences between good and evil. He, he clarifies, um, we don't believe that there are equal powers. Clearly, light fills the vacuum that is the darkness, okay? So now there's a couple of things that I want us to kind of understand, okay? First of all, this prelude, this opening prelude is written in what are known as four stanzas, four thoughts that, that the writer is trying to get across to his audience, right? That you want to pay particular attention to as we go into it. It isn't just a poetic, although some people have suggested it's actually a hymn um, that he's writing. He's trying to write what are called strophes. They're stanzas that are 
separate ideas that we want to look at as we kind of go through it, okay? So I want to kind of take you through this a little bit if I can. Um, first of all, there's the, the verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2 want to make it abundantly clear that Jesus is divinity. From the get-go, Jesus has divinity. The Word was with God and through Him at the creation of all things. He was with God. There, again, there's this idea of Eastern mysticism that a lot of people felt, and there was a heresy at the time uh, called docetism, that believed that Jesus had elevated by, being a good, by living a good life, uh, on the, sacrificing himself on the cross, um, he had elevated himself to divinity. John makes that abundantly clear that that is not the case. Um, that the creation story is part of Jesus' story. I actually brought my, my hymnal with me. Um, how many of you have ever heard of the Apostles' Creed? We, we say that like every Sunday. Um, but how many of you are familiar with the Nicene Creed? The Nicene Creed was, um, was created in order to drive this point home. Listen to the first stanzas and figure out what the point of the Nicene Creed, what the problem was that they're trying to address. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, through Him all things were made for us and for our salvation. And then the rest of it goes on. So what is the issue that the Nicene Creed is dealing with? Is the idea that Jesus was not really divine, right? That He elevated or that um, his, his divinity was really masked uh, by His outward appearance, right? It was, a, it was a way of trying to deal with how you can have one God in three persons. The Trinity has always been a struggle. And what you see from the very beginning of John's Gospel is he kind of finishes that off, if you look at it carefully, right? That he was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Okay, so the first thing that we get out of the very beginning is the relationship between light between the creation and between Jesus and the, the Father, being there at the creation, being with the Ancient of Days, right? So that Jesus' divinity is without question as we enter into the story, okay? The second one is dealing with um, his relationship to the created order, right? The dualistic language. Now, this is important. John says, in him was life. So Jesus has life, and that life is the light of mankind. So mankind is given light. All of us, men and women, have a light, the spark, the divine image imprinted upon us. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, or the darkness has not understood it. So you see here at the beginning not only that Jesus is with God, but Jesus brings this, this word, brings life, and that life is represented as the light. You're going to see this throughout John's Gospel, that there are people that are living in darkness, that the light has begun to fade from them. We have said, said this before, that faith can fade. Life, joy, hope, all can fade. If they're not tended, if they're not cared for, it will fade. And what John is saying here right at the beginning is the light of Christ, the purity of Christ has come into the world as the light is why we exist. He has our life. And yet there are people that are living in darkness. Now, even from the very beginning, we see that there's a tension that's beginning to develop, right? That Jesus comes into the world. It doesn't say that the light came into the world and everybody rejoiced and everything was just fabulous. 
The light shines in darkness, fills it, but the darkness has not overcome it or understood it, right? You're going to begin to see two things that are going to begin to happen. When Jesus comes on the scene, there are going to be some people that naturally gravitate to him. They're just drawn to him. They're like, if you will, moths to a flame. They're just drawn to that light. It is beautiful. It is healing. It is restorative. It is hopeful. On the same token, John is going to tell us, and this is a powerful story for John, that there are going to be some people that are going to be repelled by it. They loved the darkness more than the light, for their deeds were evil. That comes from John's epistle. We also begin to see that, and you're going to see that played out here in a little bit um, in the next couple of days. So you begin to see Jesus has a connection to the Father, to the created order. Jesus has a connection to the light that has come into the world. Um, the third stophus begins in verse 9. The true light that gives light to everyone had come into the world. He was in the world, and though it was made through him, it did not recognize him. This is going to be the image. They have lost. They've become so hardened or so lost. They no longer recognize the light that is shining before them. He came to that which were his own, and they did not receive him. So all of a sudden, you begin to understand that conflict is going to begin to develop. That Jesus's light and hope that is coming is not going to be received by everybody. Um, and so you get this sense of this tension that is going to naturally begin to develop. Um, Jesus' light clearly is going to divide the light from the darkness. Um, he's going to be, begin to separate. You're going to see people separate. Um, those that will embrace the light and those that will not. Um, you also begin to see uh, in John's Gospel this idea of signs, that the things that Jesus does and says and the impact that it has are signs that are pointing in a certain direction. They are there to reveal something that has a deeper purpose. Okay, so we've gone through the first three. Uh, nine through 11 is the third. Um, and then, of course, 12, um, I'm sorry, um, yeah, then 12 through uh, 19. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gives, he gives, he has the power to, to make them children of God. Now this will be, in, this, this other part is going to be, what is the nature of salvation? Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, you must be born of God. We're going to be talking about that. What does that mean? to be born of God, right? We're going to see some examples of that, and we're going to be going through. So the Word became flesh. Now, this is the incarnational impact. No other religion has this as a condition, that the God of the universe, the creation, the, the, the mind, the, the, the spirit behind everything, at its point of impact or at its intersection between God and this universe, gives rise to Jesus. It is the manifesta manifestation of God in human form. We've talked about this before. Sacraments are the place where the kingdom intersects with our human world and infuses these common elements of bread and juice with spiritual power, of water with renewal and redemption. In the same way, at the point of contact between God the Father and his created order is the person of Jesus. Right? He was, and he dwelt among us. Now, I mean, this is why there's so much in this book to, to kind of go through. It's translated, he dwelt among us. The other way to say that, or the other way that the Greek word is, the, the Greek word is skino. He tabernacled or he pitched his tent among us. Now, wh where else do you get the concept of tabernacle? Well, you get the tabernacle is what Moses created for the Holy of Holies. 
uh, because it was mobile. That's why it was called a tabernacle. It was mobile. The temple was in movement, was constantly moving, and the people followed the tabernacle wherever it went. When they built a building, they called it a temple, right? A building to, to house the Holy of Holies. So what does it mean? What does John's writers mean when it says the word took on our human flesh and it tabernacled with us? Well, part of what John is saying here is we go to the temple in Jerusalem in order to encounter the Holy of Holies, the presence of God in the Holy of Holies in this temple, which is in Jerusalem. Now he's saying the Word took on flesh and became the tabernacle, became the temple. Where do you go to see the glory of God? You don't go to the temple in Jerusalem. You go to Jesus. Jesus is the glory of God. He made his dwelling and he walked among us. The temple now became the Holy of Holies, became Jesus who exemplified who God is. We have, right, this is what we say, we have seen his glory, right? This is the Shekinah glory. Remember, whenever people would encounter the holiness of God, whether it was the prophets, whether it was Moses, take off your shoes, for this is holy ground. We have seen his glory, and it was the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Now, he goes on to talk about how it, he wants to clearly differentiate Jesus from John the Baptist. In, in this day and age, there were still people that held that John the Baptist was the Messiah. He, he was that fiery, uh, out in the wilderness kind of prophet that people were looking for. And even after his death, there were many people that felt that the Messiah, that Jesus was too familiar, right? Um, he walked and he ate with sinners and prostitutes. And, but John the Baptist was that fiery brimstone in the wilderness um, kind of guy. And people gravitated towards that. John here is making it abundantly clear. John testified about this word. He's saying, this is the one I spoke about. He who comes after me surpasses me, for he was before me. He's making it very clear that John is the herald to Jesus and not the Messiah that we're looking for. Out of his fullness, out of his abundance, out of his glory, the fullness of everything, he gave us grace and truth. Remember, he makes it clear Truth comes through Moses, through the law. He's not doing away with that, but the law is hard as nails, right? If you break it, it doesn't care why you break it, broke it or the circumstances. It's just you are condemned as a sinner. You did not live up to the standard. But through Jesus, we have grace and truth. We still have the standard. We still have holiness and perfection that we are called to do. We are called as disciples to imitate Jesus. But we're given the grace to try and try again, the constant pursuit. We're not given grace so that we can give up and say, ah, it doesn't really matter. We're given grace so that we can pursue it, the wisdom to try, the sanctification process so that we can learn and grow. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who made Himself known, for He is in the relationship with the Father. So if you want to know God, if you want to have a relationship with God, the only way you can do it is through Jesus, who knows and comes from the Father, who can reveal who Jesus, who God really is. He is, in many respects, the uh, enfleshment of all that God is doing, the fullness of God's grace. Okay, so you have these different stages that John is taking you through. First of all, he is the Word. He is the mind. He is with God. There is Trinitarian language even from the very go. Jesus is divine. All that we know, everything that we have, was made through Him. Jesus isn't a lesser God. He isn't a subset. He is 
in uh, harmony with the Father, and through Him all things were made. We also have a sense of how this Word is light, and that light is going to divide the audience. There are going to be some people that are going to be drawn to it, um, there are some that are going to be repelled by it, and there's an awful lot of people that are going to be confused by it. Okay? So we're going to learn about what that means. And then we're going to look at signs, everything that happens behind the scenes. And we're going to get into more of that um, tomorrow. And then finally, um, that grace and truth came through Jesus. All right? So we're going to look at all of those uh, through our journey. Well, friends, John is... is encouraging us to go deep. And I hope that this continues to challenge you, continues to inspire you. Um, what impact is the light of Christ making in your life? The challenges that it makes, um, it is hard. And in our world, we want to compromise um, and say close enough. But with the light, the light fills all of the voids. And so that's why it is used, this dualistic language. Well, friends, I pray that this has blessed you. I pray that the love of God, the Father, the grace of God, the Son, and the fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, will rest upon you and give you peace. Till tomorrow, God bless.